The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Luke, back there, we just met. This is the Gospel I was talking to you about. He didn't know who Luke was, but he did know, because I said Matthew, Mark, blank, and John. He said Luke, so he knew he was a Gospel writer, and his name is Luke. Anyway, Jesus passed through towns and villages, teaching as he went along and making his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? He answered, strive to enter through the narrow gate. Many, I tell you, will attempt to enter, but will not be strong enough. After the master of the house has arisen and locked the door, then will you stand outside knocking, saying, Lord, open the door for us? And he will not reply to you. He will say, I do not know you. Where are you from? And you will say, we ate and drank in your company. You taught in our streets. Then he will say to you, I do not know you. Where are you from? Depart from me, all you evildoers. And there will be wailing and grinding of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. The people will come forth from the east and west, the north and the south, and will recline at table in the kingdom of God. For behold, some are last who will be first, some are first who will be last. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I don't know if you all need a ticket, but we might need a ticket on our way in this journey. Let's look at the journey. There's a lot of journeys going on today in the scriptures. Let's look at the first journey in, written in the book of Isaiah. It's important to realize why God is welcoming these people with such encouragement. What happened was Babylon conquered Jerusalem. It was destroyed. All the people from Babylon, and this is one of the greatest tragedies next to uh, the Nazis for the Jews. It was the, the greatest tragedy that the Jewish people experience, the captivity in Babylon for generations. And what happened was, in the meantime, Jerusalem was downcast, and now it's built up. Now it is built up. Even then, when Isaiah is welcoming them back home, it wasn't built up. Every, they say there, was, there wasn't a stone upon a stone. That's how bad it was. So some of them went home to start rebuilding, and they sent messages back. Now, they were not Twitter and FaceTime messages, so they probably took a long time to get there. But basically, the message to the Jews in Babylon, who weren't even permitted to practice their faith 100%, was, come on home, we, we, we got it again. We, we're going to rebuild it and... We're going to reestablish ourselves. And what happens is <clears throat> a lot of the Jews do come home, but some of them say, you know, I, I, I don't want to work. I, I don't want to build. I don't want to rebuild. I'm staying, I'm staying put. So Isaiah is prompted to say, God speaking through Isaiah, I come to gather nations again of every nation, and I will set them as a sign among all people. He wants the people who are exiled home, and in the promise of coming home, they're going to be significant. They're going to be assigned to the entire world that this won't happen again, that God is dwelling with them and God will protect them. Now, you know, it's, we think differently than the Israelites of old. Um, we are not a political religious organization as a church. We are a religious organization. Politics is separate in the world. But in, in this time, it wasn't. The Jerusalem, as a center of culture, religion, and politics, was one. So they're thinking in that, along those lines. So he, he tells the people of Israel, the, the Lord wants you back home, and it's going to be so great. People will come offering gifts. Strangers will come. People you don't even know, different religions. Think about the background and the implications of that in reference to Jesus. See, Jesus is, quote, the new temple in a sense. And when he comes, he's like this. He's opening his arms out to everyone. And he's telling them all to come home to him. He's the temple, not the building. He's the temple. Although 
in March of 23, I'll be going back to Jerusalem with a, a group of pilgrims. If you'd like to join, let me know about that. But it, it's an amazing experience because we're actually in the area that Jesus walked and we're actually in the area that Jesus pointed to. And it's interesting when we hear more about Jesus in a second, how being there makes a big difference. So Isaiah's motive here is to bring people back home. And when they're back home, they'll be reintegrated into society, they'll be able to worship freely, and they'll be able to offer God's offerings. Jesus is walking. Now, that's, that's a pretty wide invitation. Now, in Luke's gospel, there's another journey going on. All of Luke's gospel is a journey. Every now and then, you, you get just that little phrase, here we got it here. Um, he went teaching, blah, 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 making his way to Jerusalem. So in Luke's gospel, as you read all the stories, you always have that little phrase, on his way to Jerusalem, making his way to Jerusalem. Because in Luke's gospel... Jerusalem is going to be the key and the location of the great sacrifice, the crucifixion. So Ju Jesus is going toward his crucifixion and he's teaching as he goes along. So you can just picture Jesus and all his followers and some of them really impressed with him. This guy really knows his stuff. And some of them say, oh, you know, we want to come with you. And the question is, Will only a few be saved? There's probably a thousand commentaries on what that phrase means. But salvation and healing come from the same origin, the word. So is the man or woman asking, only a few are going to follow you into salvation, or only a few are going to be saved, or only a few are going to walk with you into your new kingdom that you're going to? And Jesus <laughs> You can't back Jesus into a corner because he asks, a, he answers a question with a question. So he says, well, you heard him. Um, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. Thanks, Jesus. You know, I'm, I'm asking you how many are going to be there. And again, go back. He's walk, walking toward Jerusalem. And I can see him pointing to Jerusalem. And there's the main gate of Jerusalem. And then there's a side gate, little gates. The little gates are for people to walk through, okay? And you can't take, you know, the eye of the needle, that's the eye of the needle. Uh, of the, the camel can't go through. That's what he's pointing to. The little side gate. And he says, you know, many will come, but you got to get through the narrow gate. So he's playing like word games. He's not talking about Jerusalem, the city. He's talking about Jerusalem, heaven, the new eternal place. And the guy says to, I presume it's a guy, um, only, will only a few be saved? And he says, enter through the narrow gate. So, just picture the walls of Jerusalem, and they're, they're there today, rebuilt. Main gate, caravans, camels, and all that stuff. Small gate, individuals. But if you get a throng of people, like how many people we have here in the church, you, you, you can't go in all together, like we could as a throng through the main gates. We've got to go one at a time. So it's a little challenging. That's why I say you need a ticket. Well, not really. Well, yeah, maybe really. Maybe the ticket is faith, but we'll talk about that. So Jesus says something that is reiterated in the letter to the Hebrews. And he's the author of the letters of the Hebrews says, My son, do not disdain the discipline of the Lord or lose heart when reproved. The Lord loves people and he disciplines them. Discipline means education. So Jesus is saying, basically, you've got to be really educated. You've you got to be with us to know you're allowed to enter the gate or enter heaven. Okay, get both things going on here. And he gives this very strange um, metaphor. He says, after the master of the house is arisen and locked up, and you knock let me in, and he's going to say from inside, I don't know you. Now, imagine us, we all get up from here and here, and we all end, are at the gate of the Lord, and we say, okay, we're here, we're finally coming home. And I could just see Jesus, oh, you, mm, you, mm, you, oh, you, you, okay. 
pick and choose. What, what, why? Because he's allowing those he knows to come in. Now, don't be discouraged. Are we talking about heaven? We're talking about a metaphor Jesus has given us, and we have to apply it to our faith in Jesus. And he is that man in, in the parable. He will say, I don't know where you're from. And we will say to him, we ate with you. You, you taught with us. We, we know you. We know your mother. We know your brother. I don't know you. What's he getting at? Don't forget, he's on a journey. He's on a journey to the cross. The cross implies resurrection, implies eternal life. So as, journey, as he journeys along, he's inviting us to follow him, just like the people of Israel were invited to come home. He's inviting us to follow him, but you have a ticket. You have to have a ticket. It's not paper. It's not money. Our ticket is faith. Deeper than just eating with him and going to church with him. Deeper than um, going to class. The ticket, the faith ticket, is knowing Jesus, really knowing Jesus. What's that mean? I mean, we could read about him, we can study, we can go to Bible study, we can know Jesus. Living Jesus is knowing Jesus. There's a phrase in, in monastic communities, order et labora, work and prayer, P applies here. We have to know Jesus and work at knowing Jesus know Jesus and go out in the world and let people know we know Jesus by how we act and how we vote and how we speak to one another, how we ha handle each other. Because if he says, I don't know you because you went to church, but I didn't see any Christian actions from you. I, I don't mean to zero in on this side. It applies to them too. <laughs> okay, so... If he says to, you know, you're knocking on the door, Joe, Jesus, it's me. I went to Mass. I, I sang and I did all these wonderful things to St. Cecilia's. And he says, and after Mass, what did you do? Did you cross, cross, cut somebody off in the parking lot? Did you go to Walmart and disrespect the teller or the, the cashier because she's just a cashier? Did you respect your neighbors? Did you remember when we had church collections for food or clothing or special events to care for the poor. Did you remember all those things? Because if you didn't remember those things, you didn't remember Jesus. We need a ticket to get to heaven. And the ticket is faith, living faith. And you know what? <clears throat> you know, as well as I do, Jesus ain't easy. And we see that in our society. Don't forget what we have in the church. We have mysticism, we have um, antiquity, we have life, we have stories, we have creativity. This is, this is part of our society as a church from the time of the apostles. And many of our people, our Catholic people and other Christians, have gone to other groups, other mystical experiences, other musical experiences are the social movements. And they've done it with an anger and a hate toward the Catholic Church. And you read the papers, you know what's going on. And all the things that the so-called new people, and I don't even want to label them, are going toward, we have. We have the connection with God. And that's no small thing. In the resurrection, he proved that he could become the bread of life, and he did, and he is. But people don't want that. They want God on the platter. They want God according to their menu. They want a God, I'm not naming any kind of movements, but read the papers, know where we are criticized. And all the areas in which we as a church are criticized are the areas of our entrance into heaven. Minor, not the most important thing, but pretty important for Catholics, the rosary. It's a weapon, they call it. Well, Padre Pio called the rosary a, a weapon, too. 
Pius, uh, Pius IX called the rosary a weapon. So many great saints call the rosary a weapon. The, the church gathers here on weekdays and then we say mass after mass to say the rosary. It's a, 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 an experience of comfort. It's an experience on reflection of the whole life of Christ from before he was born until he returns in glory. So what is this secular magazine called the rosary? It's a tra trad rad traditional radical object of warfare because it brings us out of the world and into spirituality with God. It brings us in a special connection as we are living in the world with God. And some radicals pick it up and say, nope, See, Catholics hang rosaries on their cars, they hang them on their guns. I, I went to a restaurant just yesterday with someone, and I never, saw, I never saw this back home, but up north, but there was a sign on the, you know, like no entrance kind of thing sign. It was on the door, big arrow, red line across it, and it was a gun. Like I couldn't enter that restaurant with my gun. I don't own a gun, but, but that concept is interesting how, we are associated as Catholics with weapons of war and destruction. And yet the weapon we have is right there. It's Christ on the cross living. That's our weapon. You, you want to get a ticket to come to the kingdom? Follow him. Not these little islets of, of radical craziness. And I, I say craziness because some of them are really wacko. You could listen to it. You can read it. And, and what are they doing? They're trying to downplay your position in the church. Downplay it. Don't go to church. Don't be people of faith because that's nonsense. Go to over here where we, we worship with stones or rocks or smoke or music and, and that's God. Eh, it's not God. God is here with us. Are we exclusive? Well, as Catholics we are, but we've also been invited to open the doors to everyone else. That's what the first reading was about. That's what Jesus is talking about. So we're exclusive. We're in the family. We, we have our tickets, but they have to be punched and they get punched by the action we have outside the church. But our doors have to always be open to people who need us, people who belong here. I don't care what your nationality is or what your background is, what your ethnic status is. It, God wants all of us. And, and, and he makes, I mean, he, you, don't, you don't even know some of these places. I don't either. Um, he puts it into the mouth of Isaiah. He says, I will bring the fugitives from all nations. Tashish, Put, Lud, Mosak, Krabal, Javan. You know where they are? I don't. But it doesn't matter. Because God is inviting people from all over the world to his home. And you and I are the ones who are doing the inviting. One-to-one -one contact with each other. One-to-one -one that we show we are Catholics, not just because we carry a rosary or wear a cross, we're Catholics because of our actions, and our actions reflect the work of Jesus Christ, opening to all. Do you have your ticket? Is it checked? If not, I would say, you're going to hell. But that's my words. <laughs>